Hi. Uh, so, uh, we've learned a lot about SN1 chemistry and SN2 chemistry. We've learned about their rates, their um, what makes them fast, what makes them slow, uh, their mechanisms, their stereochemical implications. Um, but what we haven't talked about yet is why a specific alkyl halide would do one of those versus the other. And it turns out that the biggest component of that is what the alkyl halide substitution is. Um, so we have three different types of alkyl halides, right? We have primary alkyl halides, so that would be something like this. We'll do an X for the halogen. A tertiary alkyl halide means that it's a tertiary carbon connected to the halogen. And a secondary alkyl halide has that secondary position which is attached to the halogen. Okay, so SN1 versus SN2, what have we learned so far? So one thing we learned is that when we have a primary alkyl halide, the antibonding orbital, the sigma star, which is on the opposite side of the bonding orbital, is relatively open when you have a primary alkyl halide. Um, so the nucleophile has a lot of space to add to that primary alkyl halide. So it turns out that anytime you have the primary alkyl halide, because that sigma star orbital is so open, it will do um, only uh, SN2 chemistry. Um, also, if we think about the stability of carbocations, if this halogen just left, um, it would have a very unstable primary carbocation. I'm um, going to tell you right now, we can write this under here too, primary carbocations uh, never form. They are too unstable. So anytime we have a primary alkyl halide, it can't be a unimolecular mechanism because that would require us to have the carbocation on a primary position. What about a tertiary alkyl halide? Again, what about the accessibility of that sigma star orbital? Well, we have three large CH3s that are all hanging right around that small sigma star orbital, which is where the nucleophile would have to add its electrons. Because of that, anytime we have a tertiary alkyl halide, there's no way for it to do bimolecular or SN2 chemistry. So it will be only SN1 uh, chemistry. So yeah, only. SN1 chemistry. Um, also, why is SN1 chemistry so favorable with this tertiary system? It's so favorable because we form the most stable type of carbocation, a tertiary carbocation. And that carbocation is the most stable type. What about secondary alkyl halides? It turns out that secondary alkyl halides can essentially do either one. Um, so when would they do one? When would they do the other? Um, it turns out that nucleophile strength is what determines if, an alkyl, if a secondary alkyl halide is going to do SN1 versus SN2. So um, essentially, we can break that into two sides. If we have a strong nucleophile, Strong nucleophiles don't wait around. They are reactive. They want to react with the molecule fast. So if we have a strong nucleophile, it's going to make the process bimolecular because it does not want to wait around. So a strong nucleophile is going to do SN2 because the nucleophile, and we'll put strong nucleophile, doesn't Wait. What do we mean by wait? Uh, we mean that what happens in an SN1 reaction? The carbocation forms, then the nucleophile attacks. So if, if a strong nucleophile doesn't wait, it doesn't wait for that carbocation to form. It immediately reacts by an SN2 reaction. Um, well, how do we know if it's a strong nucleophile? That's the next question you probably have. Um, strong nucleophiles are 
negatively charged. Um, and the only case when the only, uh, what's it called when it like breaks the rule? The only, uh, yeah, the only rule breaker. So all the negative, all the strong nucleophiles are negatively charged. The only one that can be a strong nucleophile and not charged is N nitrogen, neutral nitrogen. Only NH3 is neutral and strong. So again, negatively charged nucleophiles are strong nucleophiles. The only other type of strong nucleophile is a neutral nitrogen. So NH3, uh, nitrogen with two things on it. So if we think about that like this nitrogen here, also is neutral. It also, um, so, so both of these would be strong nucleophiles. Um, all right, what's the other case? Other case is if we have a weak nucleophile. Weak nucleophiles do wait around. They, uh, they are not strong enough to react immediately. They, um, SN1, they do SN1. They wait for formation of strong electrophiles. And we think about that, what is a strong electrophile? Um, the electrophile in an SN2 reaction is just a partial positive, right? If, this, uh, if, if an SN2 happens on this secondary alkyl halide, the nucleophile is adding to a partial positive. What happens if we do SN1 chemistry? If we're doing SN1 chemistry, the nucleophile is adding to a full positive charge on a carbon. So if we have a weak nucleophile, we need a stronger electrophile to balance the process out, which means that it has to go by an SN1 process. Um, so uh, what are those weak nucleophiles? Um, weak nucleophiles would be characterized as being neutral. And there's one, um, one uh, thing that doesn't follow that rule as well. Uh, it turns out that if neutral or X minus, so halogens, halogens are weak nucleophiles. Um, so they either have to be a halogen nucleophile um, like that, that would make them, make them weak, um, or they are a neutral nucleophile that does not include the amines. Um, if you look at the pKa's of that situation, that makes sense because if we think about the stability of X minus, it's really stable. How do we know that? Well, we know the pKa of HCl. Um, HCl is a pKa of negative seven. That tells us that, that that acid is super strong. So Cl minus, if this was Cl minus, it must be super stable, which makes it a weak nucleophile, just like it makes it a weak base. Um, so you can you can consider you can use pKa's to understand why these neutral amines are strong nucleophiles versus the charged halogens are weak nucleophiles. So 